Welcome to another episode. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, right, I want to do this one today as a little bit of a guitar focus. So this is a, I want to answer a few questions that I get from a surprising number of people, specifically about this guitar. I get questions about sort of the rest of my collection, which I will come on to in future videos. But I thought I'd kick things off with an instrument-specific focus with this because I feel that. I mean, you've seen this a lot in recent videos anyway. Most of the videos I've put out recently, I think, anyway, have featured this guitar. And I've got to say that if I could only have one guitar left from what I currently have, you know, if theoretically the house was on fire and I could only grab one, it would be this one. And there's a, there's a certain couple of reasons for that, which I'm going to come on to, but this is my Gibson Custom Shop Les Paul. It's, um, it's an R8, so it's from 2011, which is when they were still using the um, R monikers to denote the year of reissue. So an R8 is a 58 reissue. At that time as well you had R7s for 57s, R9s and R0s for 59s and 60s respectively. And uh, the hunt that I was on for this guitar back in 2011, it would have been, um, was quite an interesting one. I'm going to come on to that in a minute, but... Let me first tell you why this guitar, as an instrument, is so special. When I was when I was a young guitar player, first starting out, my heroes, as I've covered in some previous episodes, uh, if you haven't seen them, you can get more info from those, but a lot of my heroes were Les Paul players. So, early on, it was Jimmy Page. And then, the big one for me was Ace Frehley from Kiss. And it was really those two guys, and I'm sure when I finish this video, I'm going to think of another one. But those are the two main players that I loved, and I bought, or rather had bought for me, very fortunately, for my 10th birthday, can't see it, but up there, my Sunburst uh, Les Paul copy, and I loved that guitar, and I played that for ages, and it quickly became my, my everything, that guitar. I experimented with different pickups in it, um, I upgraded the electronics as best as I could to try and turn that thing into the kind of machine that I would associate with those Jimmy Page and Ace Freely tones and it worked for the most part but there was always something 
that was missing and you know it happened to be that name on the headstock. Now I know there's a lot of opinions out there that you don't have to have a Gibson to have that sound and interestingly enough I kind of covered this topic on a recent Peach Guitars video that you may have seen called That Les Paul Sound and that was a little bit of the, the flip side of this coin because that was what I currently associate that Les Paul sound to be. However, I'm going back now to my, my teens, basically, early, early teens, when it meant something different. It meant a little bit more gain, a little bit more drive, um, similar to some of the tones you'll have just heard that I was playing with. So it meant a little bit something different to me. Um, and that's where this guitar came along. So what happened was, when I was, I was 15 and I had decided and I'd made a deal with my parents that um, if I did well at school and I did well in my GCSEs then when it came to being 16, uh, my 16th birthday, I could buy a Gibson Les Paul. So I thought, great, okay, I'll work hard and I'll make sure that I make that a reality. And being 15 at the time, I had amazing parents, still do, they're incredible people and they were so supportive of my musical journey. Um, and so, at age 15, we would go on trips at the weekends to music shops. Um, the big one for me at the time was going down to GAK in Brighton, where at the time my friend Joss Allen was working there. You may know Joss, who's gone on to forge quite a cool YouTube career for himself. He's a great guitar player, really good product demonstrator. Um, but at the time he was working for GAK and he was kind of the sales guy that I knew would go down there and just hang out and, and chat about guitars for most of the day, on several days. So that was a cool experience and he knew about the search for the Les Paul and um, kind of whittled it down, you know, been through about, I reckon I went through about six or seven Les Pauls all around the country in different music stores. I remember trying some in Germany as well when I was playing some gigs out in Germany. Um, and I'd kind of settled on the fact that a 58 or an R8 reissue in Tobacco Burst, I was all about the Tobacco Burst, I think maybe that was some of the slash Joe Perry connection uh, kind of leaking in as well. And I just always thought these looked a bit cooler and a bit meaner than the Cherry Bursts or the Lemon Bursts and stuff like that. Not to take away from those guitars, but that was just my opinion at the time and it still stands. So anyway, I've been through a few and one weekend going down to GAK in Brighton this guitar was there, this exact guitar, and I played it, it was the right colour, it was a good weight, though I wasn't that conscious of things like that at the time, to be honest with you it was about the colour, and also the tone, it had just had a great tone, it had a really nice thick sound, um, which some of the other guitars I played had lacked. So I kind of said, Joss, I think that's the one, please don't sell that guitar, and uh, so what happened was, this would have been a few months before my 16th birthday, you know, just in, in the hunt for the right guitar. Now, what happened was I was notified by my dad that the guitar had sold. Um, specifically, it had sold to an Australian gentleman, was what he told me. Um, now, that detail is going to be crucial a little bit later, but... So what happened, I was mortified because I thought this guitar was gone, and I thought, oh, great, okay, I'm going to have to start the search again. I was a bit miffed because I thought, I can't believe that guitar got away, um, but you know, I'll find another one, I'm sure. So, some months later, 16th birthday arrives, and to my complete surprise, total, it was just totally amazing, this guitar came out of the case, and my dad said, this is courtesy of an Australian gentleman. Now what happened is my father had fabricated this lie that an Australian had bought it, I suppose with the intention of making me think I would never see this guitar again because it was on the other side of the planet. And Joss Allen went along with this lie, so thanks to you both. Um, but an amazing little tale. I think it's such a cool story. I'm so thankful to my parents for increasing the value tenfold of this guitar to me, how sentimental it is because of that, that heartbreak I felt when I thought I wasn't going to be able to get it, and then later on discovering that actually my father is an Australian gentleman. So that was really, really cool. And ever since that point, I was just overwhelmed with this guitar. I loved it ever since I bought it, or rather it was, it was uh, given to me. And, you know, I just think that's a cool story anyway, but the guitar itself is so brilliant. So it's so meaningful to me. And I used it 
on everything going forward. I used it on a bunch of gigs from that point on. Anytime I've done any recording sessions for people as well, I tend to use this guitar from playing it solos. Uh, you know, if I know the session is going to be all about lead playing, or they're going to want a solo, uh, or any times I've recorded with bands I've been in and I've been playing lead parts, it's been on this guitar. And it just, I just know it so well. The neck, being an R8, is quite chunky, and I've always liked that extended 58 profile, still do. Um, but whenever I play this guitar now, to this day, it just feels like an extension of myself. And I think a lot of guitar players, when you're fortunate enough to find that instrument, you know that it's a keeper. And I know for a fact that this guitar will never, ever go anywhere. It's that special to me. Now, over the years, I've tried to morph it in line with what I, what my evolution of my understanding of the Les Paul sound that I'm searching for is if that makes sense. So, you know, when I got this guitar it came with burst bucket pickups, which did sound good, but very quickly I took those out and put Dimarzio PAF pickups in here, which are great. There's a few pictures and videos online of this guitar with the double cream pickups, which, again, that was an Ace Freely thing. I always loved that look. And it was a great sound, but I often just found that if I wanted to do something clean, which has only really been in sort of more recent years with this guitar, but let me give an example. I'm playing the Boogie Fillmore, by the way, on the Clean Channel, and that's why I love this guitar. It's so moldable, and it means that I can get great clean tones now. And I'll explain why that is, but let me, let me play it for you first. So, over the years, that kind of sound has become equally important to me as the well-known, overdriven Les Paul thing. So, those Dimarzios eventually went, and I brought these Bare Knuckle Stormy Monday pickups. Now, this is to answer a lot of the questions that I've had from people in recent weeks, where they've asked about what I did, because I mentioned in previous videos that you know I had to make several changes to this guitar to make it the Les Paul I wanted it to be. And... Um, you know, maybe I've overemphasized that slightly because all I've done is I changed the pickups. These are bare knuckle Stormy Monday pickups. They're unpotted, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. Can have some negative impacts on your, depending on what kind of tone you're going for, but for the most part, it breathes like no other pickup I've ever heard. And I had the, the pots upgraded as well. There was a guy who used to make these amazing looms called Shug's Looms. Uh, I think he was a Scottish guy, I believe. Made these great um, pot and cap kits that I put in this guitar and really that's all that's all I've done this guitar is getting a bit tired now it's in need of a, a, a refret because it is a bit flat in places um, I've often contemplated changing the Clusens to Grovers as well because I love that the look and I love the tonal impact that it has with that bit more mid-range and I do the, the reverse string wrap as well over the tailpiece rather than through it and that was something I took from Bonamassa years ago, I think. Um, just remember seeing all his guitars had that. It decreases the break angle. It makes the strings feel a teeny tiny bit slinkier, which means you can get away with using heavier strings. Now, something else I'll say about this guitar is I've put this thing through literal hell because it came from the shop, I guess. I think it would have been maybe even 9 to 42 strings at the time, maybe 10 to 46. And not knowing that much about guitars when I was younger, straight away I put my string set of choice at the time, which was 12 to 54 on this guitar. Didn't touch the truss rod, didn't touch the action. I don't know how this thing is still together, but it is. And it's been through a multitude of different string gauges. And I will say that nowadays, the string gauge I've settled on are these, these Ernie Ball Ultra Slinkies, which are the 10 to 48 set. I think these work great on pretty much every guitar, um, but especially Gibson's. So it's been through the ringer and it's still Miraculous. So it needs a little bit of TLC, I think, by someone who knows what they're doing. But even in its current form, I still love this guitar. I still love everything about it. 
Um, the only other thing I did as well was a phase reversal, which is on this tone pot, this neck tone pot. So you'll hear it in the middle position. So here's without, and then I'll reverse the phase. <laughs> Now, I, I featured that a lot when I did the Peter Green video earlier in this series, but I love that sound for some high gain. So check this out. It works great for that as well, and a lot of times I've recorded lead parts with that. Rather than just use the bridge pickup, I use the middle position with the volume on the neck back down to about six or seven with the phase reversed, and you get this real screaming, almost Brian May type lead tone. <laughs> to just the bridge. Michael Schenker thing, and this will pertain to my last video. So, basically, all these things added together kind of make the case for the Les Paul, in my opinion, arguably being the best all-round guitar of all time. Now, I love Telecasters, and I will make a video in the future talking about my tellies. But being that this was genuinely my first love, it's the guitar that I am definitely most comfortable on out of everything I own. And with a few modifications, it's turned into one of the most versatile and usable guitars as well. There's not really a whole lot that can be said against it in terms of anything that betters this for versatility for me as a guitar player. But I want to know your thoughts in the comments. I'm sure a lot of you are Les Paul players. What is the Les Paul sound to you? What have you done to your Les Paul to make it right for your playing needs? This is mine. This is my baby. It will never leave me. I love this guitar. I'm so thankful once again to my parents for that amazing uh, journey that I went on to actually get this guitar. And thanks to Joss Allen as well. I wanted to tell that story for a while. I think it's quite a cool one. So um, I hope you enjoyed this episode today. Bit of a rambly one, but I love this guitar and I wanted to share it with you and I'll make the effort to share more gear in future videos. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching, subscribe if you haven't already, like this video if you haven't already, comment down below with your thoughts, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon.